For those of you who are online, please forgive us. We're trying to work out some te technical difficulties. I want you to be able to see the Bible verses that we are going to be talking about today. Um, our topic today is uh, the three-dimensional war. So you'll be hearing about the three-dimensional war. Most people are familiar with a one-dimensional war. Um, and that's a war between us and the spiritual forces. But what I'm going to review, and this is a spiritual warfare topic that we discussed um, at another point. So we're going to review a little bit of that for those of you who were, were uh, here originally. Um, but it's called the three-dimensional war. So um, I have uh, Brother Joseph Kumar helping me to um, make sure that all of the technical things are available for us so that I, you can look at some of these words, verses with me and see exactly what we're talking about. So um, please bear with us. Give us a second um, and pray with us that God will help us to kind of get it all together because this topic is so critical, so crucial because most Christians don't understand how we are surrounded not only by a great cloud of witnesses, but the Bible says we're surrounded by a great cloud of adversaries as well. So there's a cloud of adversaries that surround us from beneath. There's a crowd of uh, witnesses that surround us and that are above us. Um, and then, of course, there is the congregation of angels, um, the, the angels that encamp around, around about those that fear him. Um, and then also there are company or the host of the people of God. So so we're, we're, there are a lot of various things going on, a lot of intersections, intersections of different dimensions. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about that and how that works and um, kind of everything that, that we need to do. Um, so amen, we want to do that. Now Brother Joseph, I have a question. For those who, uh, those who want to call in, they can call in, right? Okay, right, so let me let me say for those of you who are going to call in, uh, we soon will put the link up so that you can call in and that we can interact uh, through your computer. So this is an opportunity really for you to interact and to uh, engage with us in this kind of what we call um, interactive, um, high-definition um, Bible study. So it's not just... Um, one-dimensional me talking to you, but you actually talking to me, you seeing me, uh, hopefully at a later time we'll be able to see you as well. So there'll be this constant stream of information and, and, and interaction and download and equipping whatever part of the world you find yourself in. So uh, that's going to be key. So um, I'm waiting for uh, Brother Joseph to give us the link so that we can call in. But of course I want to Ava as well to pray. We, we, by the way, Brother Joseph, we, you know how many people are online currently? Okay. So for all six of you who are on, we celebrate you. We thank you for you know, working with us, with us on this experiment. It's kind of new. Um, we're hoping that you'll be able to be edified and encouraged and that you'll be strengthened and that you'll be given wisdom and that you'll be given information, revelation, knowledge, so that you can take the Word of God, apply it to your life, apply it to your mind, allow you to be renewed, and then allow you to apply that in your life to see results, to see shifting of your uh, your territory for the glory of God to stream in and the power of God to dominate. So we have some real clear objectives here. So if you stick with us, we pray that God will download to you the revelation that he has prepared for you, and that you'll be able to know your assignment, and that you'll be able to engage at a very high level and, um, and to interact with not only the power of God, uh, but also to dominate and subdue territory, and to demolish strongholds, and to overcome obstacles, whatever they may be, whether they're physical, whether they're mental, spiritual, whether they're economic, financial, um, we're praying that God will give you wisdom to, to, to remove every obstacle out of your way and any, any, any barrier so that you can excel and so that you can have victory and so you can succeed in all that God has called you to. So we're really excited to have you here tonight. Um, we got technical issues we're trying to work out. 
so that you get the full uh, experience and that every time we come on, you have access to all the tools that we have, all of the verses and all of the uh, videos and all of the various um, tools and, and, and uh, other things that we have available. We're hoping to have videos and uh, uh, YouTube uh, connections and various other kinds of tools. We just call them tools because at the end of the day, it, it's all all the various uh, informational skills that that we want to utilize so that you have everything at the, at the tip of your feet. So it might take us a while to get there, but we're dedicated. Um, and, and this essentially is the prayer ministry, the teaching um, is what is really coming after. So really what we try to do is start with prayer and then migrate into um, teaching and trying to connect what we're praying about to some sort of applicational model so that now we, what we pray about we can actually see God expressing and extending in the earth. So uh, that's kind of what we, what we want to do. So, yeah, so as like, you see, yeah, that's the, yeah, you see uh, the PowerPoint. That's the PowerPoint from before, but that, we can use that. That's fine. Um, that's good. Uh, by the way, I want to say hi to Sister Sonia from Barbados. Excited to see you. Um, Brother Joseph, do we know where everyone else is from? Or does it say? Okay, no problem. So we'll find out later where everybody's from. But, um, by the way, if you're online, uh, you have my number, send me a little text so I know you're online. I know you're connected so that we don't overlook you. Um, also, my friends from Barbados, Sister Sonia, thank you, God bless you. And for others who are online from other parts of the world, we, we're, we're excited to have you. We want to see God bless you. We want to see uh, the name of God spread into your land and the glory of God to be expressed and exhibited where you are. So this is a one-to-one a -one connection. Not really from me to you, but from God to you. That's what we pray, that God will connect you. Uh, the very presence of heaven will saturate where you are. So, uh, so, Brother Joseph now is putting the information for you in a moment to see where you can call in. And um, we're excited to have you call in and, and really interact with us and have a chance really to hear and pray and uh, to get involved with what we're, we're trying to do. Um, so what we'll start off with, just to let you know, so that you're ready, you're kind of ready to go. So we're going to start out with Ephesians chapter 6. This is the epistle that Paul wrote. And we're going to be looking at verse 12. Because we're going to be talking about the three-dimensional warfare. Three-dimensional warfare. Spiritual warfare is not just one-dimensional. But what you need to understand is that it is three-dimensional. And if you're not fighting in three dimensions, then that means that you are unprotected in at least two. So... We're hoping that this will edify you, encourage you, and inform you, but at the same time, equip you so that you're fully aware of all that God has uh, given to you and you know exactly where uh, you need to be focusing your attention. So, amen. I'm excited. I'm really excited. Um, so, Brother Joseph has put on the number there, um, the number of 515-739-1030. Uh, that's 515-739-1030. And the access code, of course, is the 423-201-152 with uh, the count. So, to able, we want to kind of reconnect. Um, um, we want to reconnect so that everybody can be on the line at the same time that we're, we're playing. So, so let, me, let me connect now just so that I'm on there as well. And we're all on the same page. Uh, so, let me see. I thought you guys would hang on one second. Yeah, I was coming to that one. Okay, okay, good. Good. All right. Okay, All right. okay so we're going to connect now. Perfect.
Yeah, of course, so you're back. Okay, good. All right, so, but you know, you can tell them they can do either one, you know. You can do either one because sometimes people can't get on the computer, but they can get on the phone. So whichever one, because it's going to be the same thing. Okay. Yeah. I brought a joke. All right, so Brother Joseph, yeah, so so we have that, so I can um, I can um, I can be on both at the same time. It doesn't bother me, right? Right, Brother Joseph, I can be on both. Okay, good. So let me um, let me see. Okay, good. Now, if the light is not so good, but that's okay, right? Or maybe I should change. Let me change it so it's a little better. So that we can get a better look. And then I'm changing my light here. So that it's a little better. Okay, so Ava, so we can do, you want to do prayer? We can do prayer and um, take it from there. Uh, Brother Joseph, so we still have people on, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, I think for live, five, five people are watching at the live. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, that means that they can hear me. Now, for the people who are online, they can write me something, Joseph? Yeah, I tell you, uh, yes, I don't know who is yes, God is our God, I know, and who is right, that he has the person. Okay, so there's some people on that who, who may yes. want to write something, right? So if you're online, yes. just want to make sure that we, knowing who you are and trying to connect with you, so could you write me a message, and perhaps I'll see it and then I'll be able to respond, just so that we're making sure that all the lines of communication, we're going to start in a few minutes, and I actually won't be long tonight, but I want to make sure that we at least know who we have online, so... Um, if you're online, um, write me a little, a little letter, or maybe a little, uh, yeah, write me something, so so that way I can see that you're. Uh, sorry, you're uh, this is Sister Charlene, one line for me, please. Sister Charlene. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're asking if Sister Charlene is online. If you can indicate that to us, that'd be great. Sister Ava wants to know um, that you're online. Uh, I'm not sure, um, or oh, just a study you were saying, uh, volume of low. 
I'm not sure if Chadi is on now. Oh, uh, right. It's the Chadi out there. Let's see. I said the volume was low, so... Yeah, that's what Joe said. Okay. So, Brother Joseph, can you turn up the volume of it? Oh, Denise Green? All right, Denise. Denise, how are you? God bless you. So excited to hear and see you. Uh, now, I'm not seeing anything, but you're seeing it, Joseph, yes? Yeah, let's, let's say I did. I did uh, Okay. 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 All right. So, so let me, um, Brother Joseph. I want to go back to uh, the Bible verse. And Sister Amy, you wanna. So, how you wanna proceed? You wanna pray, and then um, we go from there, or how you wanna proceed? Since your Nehemiah is, you're you're in charge of it, so. Okay, all right. You know, like, sure. you know, like, well, if you want to do a public prayer, they can't hear me. Can they hear me? Brother Joseph, they can I hear can. her, right? Yeah, I, I can hear. Actually, whoever is the conference, that they can hear. No, they should okay. be able to hear. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, good. Grace, actually, the multiply to you all to the knowledge of God the Father. Welcome to today, Mayor. This is the Amen. Okay. Brother Joseph, I want to see if I can pull up those things. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I Oh, I see. I see. Okay, no problem. I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Make the black one and then come out. Okay, perfect. I can do that. All right. So yeah. let me. Okay. Okay, great. Great. All right, so let's see. Okay, so David, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, the study was just saying that um, the body was better. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right, I wonder if anyone is on from Barbados, you know? Yes. It's what? Oh. Okay, we have to figure out what's going on there. There are a lot of difficulties, but we'll we'll work it out. So, yeah. So, so we'll see. Okay. So.
Amen. Amen. So I see that Sister Anne Marie is on as well. So I saw it come up. So Sister Anne Marie, God bless you as well. Good to see you. Um, so today, I think we should start. So let we can start. Remember, this is a review. So we're going to kind of go back to what we discussed before. And um, I just want to share a few verses and then get into a discussion. So tonight is primarily going to be focused on reviewing some of the principles that we reviewed before and then maybe going into a little bit of uh, question and answer so that it's not just lecture or me um, telling you this or telling you that but rather an interaction between you and I. So so I think um, one of the first things I want to start with is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. So let's see if I can um, start there. So, now, it's very easy to read it, I mean, or even to quote it, but again, we're talking about the three-dimensional war. So, let me let me start by doing a little bit of an introduction. So, um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, of course, the Apostle Paul, um, writing to the church at Ephesus, and in verse 11, he says, finally, my brethren, his last thoughts to the... Um, uh, Ephesus Church is finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Um, what's interesting there in that particular um, portion is that he says, um, uh, actually, it's verse ten. So Ephesians six, verse ten. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. What's interesting there in verse ten is that there are three kinds of power that are spoken about in that verse. So, finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, number one, strong, and in the power of His might. So, three, three words, three different Greek words there for power, which suggests that it's not just being strong in the Lord, but it's a matter of being strong in the Lord and using His mighty power. Three separate words for power there. Three different dimensions of power. Three different kinds of power that will be required to be strong and to fight against. If you look at the next verse now, um, the Bible talks about um, us fighting against or uh, wrestling against principalities and powers. That comes actually in verse uh, 12, but verse 11 then talks about the wiles of the devil. Uh, now, it's critical that you understand that the Bible, in these three verses, is setting up a scenario where you understand that it's not just fighting against the enemy. But the Bible says it's going to require for you to have three kinds of power, three dimensions of power, three different aspects of power, to engage with the wiles of the devil. By the way, the word wiles there is an old um, English word which means strategy. So the enemy is utilizing high level strategy, spiritual strategy. And as a result, um, you need to be understanding that these strategies that come against you are going to be arrayed against you in multiple dimensions, which we'll talk about in a minute. So not only do you have the multiple dimensions, not only are you fighting against um, spiritual powers, and you're also fighting against strategies of the enemy, the Bible goes on to say that you have to be aware of the wiles of the devil and put on the whole armor of God. In other words, it comes at you at all levels, in all dimensions, at all in all situations. Um, the Bible says, actually, in the book of uh, Corinthians that we are pressed on every side. So this idea of being pressed on every side, being surrounded on every side, being attacked and assaulted on every side, but God has not made us afraid. In other words, we don't have any fear. Why? Because we are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We have three different types of power to express against the enemy. So this should give you some kind of idea that what we're wrestling against and what we're fighting against is more than just a unidimensional battle. It's not just us against the enemy. 
But as I'm going to show you, when the Bible starts to set up um, this thought about having multiple kinds of power. By the way, there are at least seven different kinds of power. I remember talking about this in one of my fifth class. I told them that the Bible uses seven different words for power. So you have, in one case, you're familiar with Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where the Bible says that, and you shall receive power, that power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That kind of power is referred to as dunamis power, dynamic power, supernatural power. But that is to be distinguished from another kind of power where Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, he says, all power has given, been given unto me in heaven and earth. That word, that word for power there is not dunamis. That actually is the word exousia, which means authority. So that's a different level of power, different dimension of power, different aspect of power. So, without me going into all the words, and there's ischius power, uh, and, 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 you know, again, there are many other Greek words. So the Greek language is very specific in all the various kinds of words that are, uh, are dealing with power. So you don't use the same power. Every, every force you fight against, you know, will, will require the same power. There are new powers. There are, there are different kinds of powers, different kinds of strategies that require different kinds of um, um, weapons. So, again, you must begin to think not like an American, but think like a Jew understand that Hebrew and Greek, which are the mother languages of the Bible, really give us a more fuller picture of what's going on both mentally, both internally and externally. And it's critical that you understand that the Word of God is designed to equip you so that you fully know everything that's arrayed against you. So that when you engage in battle, you engage in battle at the highest level and you use all the weapons that you've been given so that you can overcome. And that's why the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. You have to use everything that God has given you. What's sad to me is that many Christians today are not really familiar with everything they've been given. So they tend to utilize some of the partial things they've been given. They only use the little bit they know. And then they become prey for the enemy. So, uh, by the way, in one of our other courses, we spoke about not being ignorant of his devices. To say, Avery, you recall that? We spoke about not being ignorant of Satan's devices. Remember that? Okay. So... For those of you who were in the class before, we talked about all the devices of the enemy. Tonight, tonight we're not going to revisit that, but we will talk about, as we have, the three kinds of power, right? Might, strength, and power. Three different kinds of Greek words that show us different aspects of power that will be required to confront the wiles of the devil. And then the Bible goes on to say that we should now, for we wrestle. Now, that's what I want to get to. It's only after verses 10 and 11, 10 talking about being strong with the three kinds of powers, and then 11 talking about going against the wiles of the devil, the strategies of the devil, that we come to verse 12, which then talks about, now we wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, and what that really should say is not merely against flesh and blood. So write that down in your notes. We are fighting against flesh and blood for sure, because that's what we see in the natural. But it's not merely flesh and blood. It's not merely the natural. The Bible suggests that there's other dimensions, that there are other, uh, other players, other factors involved with this warfare. Um, and you need to understand that because most Christians are not getting this. So they get angry at people, and they don't get angry at the uh, potentates or the power brokers in the spirit realm that are literally engaging you and that are seeking to trap you and confuse you and deceive you. So I want to be clear that there's a war going on. Some of us know that. But what's sad is that we don't even know the players. So write this down in your notes. It's not only important to know what, in what areas we're fighting, what dimensions we're fighting on, but we need to know the chief players. We need to know the power brokers. We need to know those who are engaged in warfare and what their rank is. So everybody has a rank in the spirit realm. You need to write that down in your notes. Everybody has a rank in the spirit realm. Even Christians have a rank. Now, we're all supposed to be the sons of God. We're supposed to all have a high rank. But the sons of God uh, is very much associated with uh, maturity. So you can't just have a high rank because you're the son of God. I mean, the Bible says, 
um, in Romans chapter, uh, not Romans, sorry, in John chapter 1 verse 12, that um, for as many as believed, to him, believed him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. By the way, there's that word power again, right? To those who believed in Jesus, he gave you the power to become a son of God. So just being in the family of God introduces you to a dimension of power. Now the question is, can you, can you utilize that power? So just because you're in the realm of power doesn't necessarily mean you understand the power and more so how to use the power or the powers, right? So you're birthed by power. The Bible says God has delivered us. This is Colossians chapter 1. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son by power. So it takes power to deliver you from darkness and it takes power to place you in the kingdom of light. But once you are there, you have to mature in that power so that now you can begin to um, gather the powers. And then now when you have the powers, you're able now to fight against the wiles of the enemy. And you're also able to engage the enemy at the highest level. Now if I'm going too fast, please forgive me. Um, I want to be deliberate. I want to be concise. I want to be uh, methodical. I want to be uh, comprehensive. So when I'm going through all of this, I try to make sure that I'm putting all the pieces together so that you can see them as we go along so that you don't miss anything. One of the things that I always hated when I was in school is learning something and then missing something. So I don't want you to miss something. So I'll be repetitious. I'll be reminding you of things while I move on. But I don't want to be long. Um, so if you're getting something from this so far, just write in something so that I can hear. Or, or, or I know Sister Dave is on the line, Brother Joseph is on the line, but if, you write, if you're getting something out of this so far, write in something so that I can see. Uh, Brother Joseph will tell me what you wrote, and then I can know that I'm actually getting through. I want to know that I'm actually hitting something. That I'm, you know how when you shoot at a target, you want to make sure you're hitting something. So are you getting something from that, what I just said? Did you, did you get any revelation from that? Did you learn something new? Was there something fresh there? So... I'm going to continue, but if you, if, you, if you got something, just let me know. So, let me now move on to the war, the three-dimensional war. Now, I told you Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 talks about the war without. So, let me give you the, let me give you the, 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 um, the framework of what I want to talk about briefly tonight. I want to talk about the war without. So, write down in your notes, the war without. What I mean by that is that there's a war going on outside of your body. So it's without. Not without meaning that you don't have, but without meaning outside of your body. So there's a war without. But the Bible also talks to us about the war within. So there's the flesh and then there is uh, the spirit. And there's a war going on. Um... There's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And then there is the, uh, the love of the Father, which is dominated or which emanates from your spirit man. So there's a war. By the way, part of that is the war without, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. But then some of that is the war within, the carnal mind, the flesh. Right? And then there's the war between. So the war without, the war within and then the war between. Now I'm going to have to show kind of what those are, so let me just outline them quickly. Three-dimensional war. There's the war without, which is between us and spiritual forces externally. Then there's the war within. The Bible says that there's an outer man and an inner man. The outward man is perishing. By the way, i got to find that verse, Brother Joseph. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. So, there's a war without, between the spiritual forces in the external spiritual world, and you. Then there's the war within. So, that's the issues assaulting your mind, your soul. So, there's the body, and outside the body, the war between the world and the body. And these are just generic terms, okay? So, I don't want to be very specific and try to be very precise but I just want to try to give you a general overview of kind of what we're talking about. So, there's the war within, which is between your mind and the carnal mind, right? So you have the spirit mind, the mind 
of God that is being renewed. But then you have the old man. So you have the new man and you have the old man. And there is this conflict between the new man and the old man. Uh, and again, we'll show verses for this. I mean, for those of you who have been Christian for a little while, you will recognize these terms. And the Bible talks about how we have an outer man and an inner man. So I kind of review that and I kind of go through that. For instance, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says God made man from the dust of the earth. That would be the outer man. But then he breathed into them the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That would be the inner man. So the Bible distinguishes between the three parts of man. The outer man, which is one. The inner man, which is made up of two parts. The soul and the spirit. Now let me just be clear. It seems like I have to do a lot of definitions tonight. So the outer man is referring to the, the physical body. Physical body. The inner man refers to the invisible part of you, or the spirit man, which really is divided into two parts, the soul and the spirit. But it's the invisible part of you. So there's a visible part of you, which is the physical man, and then there's an invisible part of you, which is broken into two parts, the soul and the spirit. Now what, does, what do each do? Let me just help you. The body gives you earth consciousness. It's going to really help some of you. By the way, I, did, I still didn't get any feedback knowing that you're still there. Uh, Brother Joseph, we still have a couple of people online watching us? Yes. Okay. So the computer tells me you're still there. So um, if you're there, just write in, hey, Dr. Wells, I got you. I'm hearing something. I'm learning something. Just so I know. I'm going to drink my tea, if you don't mind. Um, so you have the outer man, which is the body. And that gives you earth consciousness. So you're conscious of the earth through your body. So using your five senses, you're conscious of the natural realm. That's earth consciousness. Now the soul, that part of you that is separate from your physical body, um, even though they're in interconnected, God made them so that they'll fellowship, that they'll connect. But the soul part of you is the part that gives you self-consciousness. So you have the body, which gives you earth consciousness, consciousness of this physical realm. Then you have the soul, which gives you self-consciousness. So now you're aware of yourself. So when you're sad, that would be your soul. When you are happy. Now, it's very interesting. I want to be careful about happy, right? Because some of these things are a little more complex, right? So there are things where there are elements that are, sh are, sh are shared, right? So when you're happy, your body reacts a certain way. So everything is connected, but just for, you know, pure descriptional purposes, we'll talk about the various uh, parts. So you have the natural man, the physical person, who is earth conscious, spirit or the soul, which is self-conscious. I know who I am. I know how I feel. I know what I think. So that's the soul. But then if you go one step further, the Bible says that you also have a spirit. Now, the spirit is the part of you that is God coming. So now we see three different dimensions. The physical, the soul, and the spirit. Now, here's the thing. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. So there is a jurisdiction that each of these parts play. Now they are interlinked and intermingled. And they do, it's very dynamic. But God says that you are a spirit. So what you are is spirit. Why? Because God is spirit. And you're made in his image. So what, make, what, what you really are in essence is a spirit. But you have a soul. So God has given you an extra medium or extra dimension by which you can express yourself. So it was just a gift of God, right? So the soul part of you has these emotions that are, uh, are that allows you to fully express yourself. Um, now, what's interesting is that angels are ministering spirits and they have emotion, but what we have is another dimension, unique, called the soul, something that God created. And then you have the body, which makes us conscious of uh, of, of this realm. So. It's a, it's a physical body um, that makes us conscious of this physical world. Now, by the way, the world is purely physical now, 
But at one time, it was spiritual physical. It was a combination of spiritual and physical. I can't go into that right now because then we'll be really confused. So hopefully you got it down. Now, where is the warfare? Well, the warfare is between demonic forces, the body, on the outside. But then they are not only interested in that. It's also between your soul, your mind, right? There's a warfare between your mind, the new mind, and the old mind, right? And then there is the spirit, the warfare for your understanding about God. So there's an attack on your spirit with, with relationship to your consciousness and awareness of God. So the enemy is attacking you in all three dimensions. The question is, what are your defenses in each realm? Now, um, I want to just throw in some verses so you realize that um, I'm not really crazy. So, so I'll show you in Scripture where this is true. So we started off, first of all, in Realm 1, where we spoke about, for we wrestle. So Ephesians 6.12 talks about the external war. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So we're wrestling against, on the outside, principalities and powers. Beings that are outside of us. Principalities and powers. And by the way, these are, these are, there's a difference between angels and demons. Fallen angels are not demons. And demons are not fallen angels. So you need to understand when the Bible talks about principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, um, rulers and brokers of the, of the darkness of this world, it's talking about different things. When it talks about the wiles of the devil, when it talks about evil spirits, and it, and it contrasts, it contrasts evil spirits uh, to seducing spirits, to malignant spirits, to deceptive spirits. These are all different kinds of forces that are arrayed against us in different realms, having different assignments, attacking different parts of the three or the tripartite beings. Now, I know for some of you, this is really, really, like, way out there. You're like, Dr. Yet Wells, I know that I'm a spirit man, but the idea that I'm actually being attacked outside and inside, really, I'm not familiar with. And, and as a result, I haven't developed any defenses. I mean, I know that I'm fighting against the devil. Okay, so he's on the outside. But now I'm telling you, the enemy is actually trying to have a warfare within. And that's why Paul, in the book of Romans, uh, and we're going to go there in a minute. And remember, I'm just giving you an introduction. Then I'm going to quickly go on just to show you one or two verses and then get out your way and then listen to your question. So I kind of outlined, give you the sketch of the three areas. And again, this is review. We reviewed this in, at length at another time. We showed you how the war on the outside. Now let's talk about the war within. And for this, I think we need to go to Romans um, chapter 6. So, um, Brother Joseph, let me pull, pull up Romans chapter 6, and uh, we'll go with the Apostle Paul, and we'll talk about the, you know, the, the, the natural man and the, the, the carnal man and being dead to sin and alive to God. Again, you want, you want to understand what Paul is saying. Um, now, Romans 6 talks about a lot of different things, but, uh, for instance, if you look at Romans 6 verse 12, it says... Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So the Bible again talks about a mortal body. Physical. No, it's not the immortal body, but the mortal body. The physical. And then the Bible talks about obeying its the passion. This is verse 12. Um, and do not present your members as um, members of uh, or instruments for unrighteousness. In other words, God says your body literally has to be given to him so that he can use your body as uh, an instrument of righteousness. Notice that the body follows the mind. So, when you give your body, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, as a living sacrifice, you're giving your body over to God. Why? Because it's following your soul, which is really following your spirit. So let me be clear. God designed it so that your body would follow your soul who is following your spirit. So there is a hierarchy in the things of God. The spirit man dominates, soul submits to the spirit man, and the body submits to the soul. We have actually turned it around, where now the body is in control. The soul follows the body, 
And then the spirit man is subject to both of them. And the Bible refers to this as the carnal man, um, who is basically following the flesh, following the, the mindset of the fallen nature. And this is critical that you understand that, because there, there is this war within, between the new man and the old man. Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Paul talks about the old man and the new man. The new man is the one that follows the spirit, the soul, the mind, following the spirit, the inner man, following the spirit. But the old man is following basically the lusts and desires and the passions of the body, which is really dominated by the spirit. Now, this is a little confusing, so let me see if I can break it down. You have the body, and you're not saved. You have the spirit man dead. Get this now. This is critical. Before you became a Christian, no, let me go back. Before, let me go back even further. Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve had a body, had a spirit, had a soul. God says, "The day you eat, you shall surely die." What happened? When Adam ate, he died spiritually, and then eventually, his physical body died, and throughout, throughout his whole life, his soul was dying. So he died in all dimensions. Now, since we are the sons of Adam, we were born into the fleshly world. We're born into a world where the spirit is dead. So the only thing we have is the body and the soul. Now, the soul doesn't have the leading of the spirit. It makes us conscious, but it doesn't have the leading of the spirit. So it partners with the body. So it gets its information from the natural world. So then all we can think about are things that are dominated by the natural. So we are carnal. We are fleshly. We are we are following the dictates and desires of our five senses. That world, that realm, is dominated by the demonic. So now Satan can dominate that world and control the way we think, because he controls the what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we feel, and all of those things. Five senses. So the five senses are gates, and through those five gates, all the information that comes through influences our, our soul. So we feel certain things because the information coming through the five gates. God says, no, you must put to death that understanding coming through the five gates of the natural senses. And you must now open up your spirit man to get downloads from heaven. So now when, this, when you are born again, when you are saved, your spirit man becomes alive. The spirit of God resurrects you from the dead. Your spirit becomes alive. You're reconnected with God. So his spirit, Romans 8. By the way, let's turn to that. I want to make sure. Romans 8. Hallelujah. Romans 8. I start, start off with Romans 6 where it says you can't obey the mortal man. Um, but let me go over to Romans 8 because uh, Romans 8 really puts it together, right? Uh, so in Romans 8, um, the Bible talks about how... Um, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So you are condemned being a son of Adam. But when you were born again, you are passed from death to life. You are no longer under condemnation. So your spirit is alive now. So now you can interact with God. And therefore you can receive downloads from God. So now listen to Paul. He says um, that according to verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. This is verse 5. And those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So notice that it's not just thinking about those things, but it's literally following the dictates of those things. So you're following the flesh or you're following the Spirit. You're dominated by carnal or you're dominated by spiritual. You are being fed information from the natural which is really not natural. And by the way, I want to be clear. We talk about the natural realm, but there really is no such thing as the natural realm. The natural realm really is illegal. It is really not natural. It's really unnatural. And I know that's confusing. I'm sorry. But we have to be careful that we understand what the Bible is really saying. The natural world, as we see it today, is a world that is basically apart from God. It needs to be reconciled to God. The fall of Adam caused the divorce between that which is spiritual, really, and that which is natural. Remember, at one time they were together, 
But because of the fall of man, there was a divorce. Adam fell. The fall of man caused there to be um, a separation between the natural and the spiritual. And as a result, the natural realm is a realm that's dying. So that's why we have thorns. That's why we have death. That's why we have, you know, um, everything dying eventually. Right? Because it was never meant to live without God. So once you separate from God, everything that separates from God, God is life, dies. Are y'all getting this? I know this is now beginning to cause you to see things differently. Wait a minute, the natural world is really not natural? No, it's not natural. It's unnatural. What's natural is for us to be connected to God. What's unnatural is for us to be apart from God. That's why Jesus came to restore things back to the natural. And what we call natural today is really unnatural unholy and separated from God. What's natural for us is to be in the image of God, be connected to God, have His Spirit connected to our spirit, and that we were receiving information from a higher realm, not the lower basement. I don't hear hallelujah, but I'm going to say it. Hallelujah. And it's this insight, this revelation, this mindset that informs you how to wrestle both the out, outward, uh, war and the inner war. I'm coming back to the inner war. Now, I just want to go to this. Where the Bible says in um, verse 26, this is where I wanted to get to, it's Romans 8, 26. Um, it says there, um, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. By the way, we've been talking, we talk often about intercession, but what to say, but we need to really talk about is how while we intercede for others, the Spirit of God intercedes for us. Now that's an interesting. The ministry of the Spirit of God when it comes to our intercession. Intercession for us. We have to talk about that one. But then it says, um, and the Spirit searches the, the mind of the deep things of God, the mind of God, verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I wanted to get go through all of this and kind of just give you an idea of um, uh, kind of what God is talking about being spiritually alive. But there, is, there was a verse that I was trying to get to. I just have to find it. But essentially the verse is saying that um, um, being a child of God means that you have the Spirit of God. That's one of the key elements of being a child of God. You have the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Um, I know it's here in Romans 8. just can't put my finger on it. Um, Dave, if you see it, just, just remind me. I know it's in one of these verses. But basically, it talks about how um, we are, we, we, those who are, who, are, who are following God have the Spirit of God. And the children of God are the ones who have the Spirit of God. And it's the Spirit of God that lets us know that we are the children of God. And this is a very, very critical critical verse there. So anyway, the, the war without, spiritual forces, now the war within, the carnal mind, the, 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 the natural mind. You saw it there in Romans 8 when Paul says that, um, verse, verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh. Actually, let me go a little further. Let me go up to verse 6. Let me go even further than that, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. Notice what Paul said. Paul says that mindset that gets information from the carnal realm is doomed to death. But that other mindset, which is connected to the mindset of God, the realm of God, the realm of heaven, gives you life. And then he goes on to say not only life, but life and peace. So it's interesting. Both life and peace come out of having a mind that's connected to heaven. But death comes by having a mind that's connected to the earth. And that mind that feeds into the inner man literally doesn't give you peace. Remember, following the Spirit of God gives you life and peace. Following the carnal mind and the demonic mindset creates war. And that's what I wanted to show you. Notice the mindset of the, of the, of the world, the mindset of the flesh, the carnal mind produces war. War where? Between your inner man, uh -huh, whether it's between your, 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 um, your new mind and your old mind, or whether it's between 
you're the spirit of God in your spirit. So there is this warfare going on. Well, first of all, the, the war without. Then there's the war within. Mind to mind, soul to soul. Carnal to new man. And then there's the war between. Aha. Uh -huh. Not only between your spirit and God's spirit, but between your soul and your spirit. Oh, now we're getting down to it. It is not only a war with the external world, supernatural forces, but there's a war going on between your, 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 your renewed mind and your old mind. Then there's a war also between your spirit and God's spirit. And then there's also a war, if you're not careful, between your soul and your spirit. The soul and your spirit. By the way, let me just say this, make it clear. There's really not a war between your spirit and the Holy Spirit. Because, by the way, the Bible says that you are born again by the Spirit of God. Right? There's not a real war there, but there's an attempt to create a war when there is a, a, a fight between your soul and your spirit. So the soul and spirit is where there's a war. Then there's the mind and mind, the renewed mind and old mind. And then there's the war from without, the war against spiritual forces. So are you guys seeing this now? How the Bible says that when Jesus came, and I want to go to Romans 5 because I want to show you this. Romans 8 talks about following the carnal mind and how the carnal mind leads to death. Then he goes down to talk about, let me go down a little further before I go to Romans 5. For the mind is set on the flesh, is hostile to God. Look at verse 7. The mind that goes along with the information coming through the five gates is hostile to God. That would be war. There's a fight. There's a warfare. Hostile to God. But the mind... Okay, let me slow down. So David says, I'm going too fast. So let me slow down. So there's a war between the Christian and the external demonic force. That's the war with that. Everybody clear with that? For we wrestle not against, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You can see war with that. Then there's the war within. I showed you how Paul says that there is the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. Romans chapter uh, 8 verses 6 and 7. The mind of the spirit and the mind of the flesh. War. Okay, so that's good. You get a little feedback. So there's the warfare between the mind. Between the mind. The mind of the spirit and the mind of the flesh. By the way, each one of them are being controlled and being dictated to and being fed information. That's why the Bible, in a minute I'm going to show you Colossians chapter 3, which talks about how you need to shut off the mind that is trying to feed you through the flesh. Shut it off. Kill it. God says, just kill it. Because if you don't kill it, it will cause you to be double-minded. Oh boy, James. The book of James. Talking about being double-minded. In a minute, I'm going to show you, that's why the Bible says you've got to have one mind. You have to be of one mind. You can't be double-minded. You can't double-dip into two minds. Because that will make you unstable. Mm, now you see, again, a warfare. That war within. An un uh, think about it. You have a warfare within you that makes you unstable within yourself. That's the whole purpose of the enemy, to make you unstable inner, in the inner man. And then when you're unstable in the inner man, it's going to manifest in the outer man. So now, as you put all this together, you're beginning to see that the enemy has done a tremendous job of confusing Christians and the world about where the war is. Notice there used to be a war between you and God. But I'm going to show you now, if you look at Romans 5, when we look at Romans 5, I'm going to show you what happened when you became a Christian. Um, Romans chapter 5 is going to show you what happened with the war between you and God. There used to be a war. Colossians also talks about it. A war that was between mankind and God. Right? Um, but what happened was, the warfare was settled when Jesus died. Um, and as a result, Jesus fixed the problem. Um, and Jesus dying literally corrected the problem. So there was no longer a war between you and God anymore. 
because Jesus has come and he's brought peace um, through, through, through the blood of his cross. So, I mean, I think you know these things, but it's good that we remind ourselves that we have peace with God. Remember the Bible talks about says that we have the peace. By the way, the two kinds of peace. Let me just say this while I'm here. I wasn't going to make this my topic, but since we're here, I want to give you as much revelation as I can. Don't know whether I'll be with you again or whether you will be in the same fashion. So I might as well give you everything. There is the peace with God. Uh -huh. We have peace with God. So that is distinct from the peace of God. So there's the peace with God, meaning we're not warring with God. We're not contrary to God. We're not fighting against God anymore. We're like cooperating with Him. But when you have the peace with God, that is because we've been reconciled. But the peace of God is because of our relationship. Peace with God is reconciliation. Peace of God is relationship. And we have the benefit of both. What Satan wants to do now is he wants to upset your peace with God and also upset the peace of God. Philippians 4 says, And the peace of God shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, I think, verse 6. Pray with all uh, prayers and the peace of God will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Notice the peace of God. And then Romans 5 talks about the peace with God. So we have the peace with God, the peace of God. Now, what's interesting is that that peace is perfect peace. Because Jesus is the Prince of peace. And now Satan, who is now the adversary, by the way, I want you to understand a term that I, I, I taught in one of the spiritual warfare classes that I'm not sure people really picked up on. Um, you know, the Bible talks about Satan being, um, you know, an adversary, right? So he's at war. Uh, the Bible also calls him a, you know, he, he's basically a malignant being, right? So he's, he's at war with God. He's fighting God. He's, he's antagonistic to God and to everything that's associated with God. So he's at this constant war. With God, he 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 he's he's at rebellion. Ah, that's where I want to get. So write down in your notes. This is key key. Satan rebelled against God, and he's in an act of rebellion. Rebellion. Now, if you look at the word rebellion, a very interesting war word because now you're going to see why the word war comes up. And I'm going to stop in about five minutes, but I want to get your thoughts on certain things. But notice the word rebellion. Made up of two words, re and bellare. Actually, I think it's a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a, it's a Latin word. Um, re bellare. Re meaning to do again. Bellare means to be at war, constant war. So when you talk about someone being in rebellion, it means someone who's warring or is constantly at war with something. So when the Bible talks about Satan being a rebellious being, it means that he's constantly at war with something or someone. And that something or someone is the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God, the throne of God, the, the goodness of God. He's in rebellion. He's in a constant state of war. So, of course, when he comes to you, he's at war with you because you made him the image of God. You're the sons of God. So now he's warring with you externally. He's warring, warring with you mentally. He's also warring with you spiritually. And you need to now develop defenses in all three dimensions. So I think I've made the case. Uh, I went to Romans 8. I went to Romans 5. I also want to go to Colossians just, just for completeness. Um, I want to go to Colossians uh, chapter 3. And I'm going to show you where the Bible says that you literally have to kill the carnal mind. You have to mortify. Um, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Notice, you were born again. Spirit man has been raised. Set your hearts on things above. Notice, your soul should be focused on things above. All right. David said, repeat those verses. So, 
I went to, first of all, Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 spoke about holy wrestling. Against principalities and powers. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not in that particular order, but those who are mentioned. And against rulers or brokers of the dark world. Right? And I showed you that that's the war without. So these forces are outside of us. They're distinct and external sources. But then we spoke about in Romans chapter 6 how the carnal mind wars against the spirit mind. Right? So the two minds war. Notice God has given you the mind of Christ. But because you have a soul, and by the way, I need to say this, or this is going to be really helpful. Your salvation, oh, I, this, I really should have shared this before I end. Let me share this. And I know some of you are now going to start putting all the pieces together. You have been saved in three parts. Oh, this is good. I usually teach this in my, um, in, um, you know, the, the, the spiritual, um, the disciplines class, but I also teach it in general theology class, right? Uh, there's a part of your um, a doctrine in the Bible called uh, soteriology, the study of salvation. And a lot of Christians don't know that your salvation is in three parts, right? You were saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Now, you're saying, Dr. Well, I never have even heard of anything like this. Follow me. You were saved. Meaning that the minute you accept Jesus as your Lord, you were saved. You were passed from death unto life. Right? But you still sin. So, you were saved from the, from the penalty of sin. Right? So now you're a Christian. But you are being saved. Right? Right now you're being saved because the Bible says, let not sin have dominion over you. So your, 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 your soul is learning how to live by resisting sin. You still fall sometimes, but you can overcome. You can resist sin. So there's a process of being saved now. The Bible calls this sanctification. Right? So you are daily being saved from the, from the, from the, from the practice of sin. So you're saved from the penalty of sin. You're daily being saved and being sanctified not to practice sin. But then there's coming a day when you'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. You'll no longer be in this sinful body. The Bible says he'll give you a new body. So your salvation happens in three parts. You were saved from the penalty. You are being saved from the practice. And one day you'll be totally saved from the very presence. So your 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 not only do we have a three dimensional war, but it turns out that we have a three dimensional salvation as well. <laughs> now you may have never heard that, but if you think about it, this is what Paul is saying: that you are saved, justified by faith. But then, right now, the Spirit of God is working in a, the ministry of sanctification. You're being saved from the practice of sin, and then one day. You know, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up. Philippians 4, and then we will have a new body and that doesn't even desire sin anymore. And we'll be taken out of this world of sin and literally be delivered from the sinful world. So that's the presence of sin. So the penalty of sin, the practice of sin, and the power, and the, sorry, the presence of sin. How about that? That's soteriology, the study of salvation. Now that's really interesting. Wow. Very, very interesting to process that out. Now, so I talked about Ephesians 6. I talked about Romans uh, chapter 6 as well, where Paul talks about the mind. And then I spoke to, spoke to you about Romans 8, where the Bible says that we, for as many are the children of God, um, for as many, as many have the Spirit of God, are the children of God. I didn't really show you that verse, but I'm going to have to get that verse because I don't like to leave anything incomplete. But it's already 10 o'clock, so I'm not going to go much longer. But um, let me see if I can just locate that verse. Uh, yeah. 
For as many are the sons of God. Yeah. Uh, from, no, for it says, for as many, for as many are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So Romans 8, 14. So, think about this now. But we learned a lot in this little section here. We learned that the warfare is on three dimensions. Now we learned that our salvation is in three dimensions. And that um, the enemy is trying to attack us in the area of peace. By the way, if you are not living in the peace of God, then that means you're in a state of war. You can't be... And if you're in a state of war... By the way, uh, let me just say this. I got, the Spirit of God just prompted me. I need to tell you, if you have anxiety, if you have fear, if you have stress, that is actually the um, results of war. You only have stress when you're at war. You only have fear when you're at war. So God, that's why God says that we should be in perfect peace. The Bible says you'll keep his mind in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So if your mind is not stayed on God, then you're, then you're worried. That means that you're at war. That means the enemy is winning. The Bible says if you have fear, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. War and fear go together. Anxiety and, 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 and war go together. Uh, stress and war go together. So whenever you're feeling anxiety, you're feeling stress, or you're feeling fear, that means that you are, you, are, you are coming out of the peace of God, and now you're going back into the carnal mind, which means you're at war. war at war with yourself, and at war with God. Because think about this. If the Word of God is your confidence, then you know that if God be for you, who can be against you? So if you are wary, that means you don't believe that. So that means that you actually disagree with God. And that's what people do when they are at war with God. They disagree. <laughs> so now you realize what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to get you to disagree with God so you have war with God so that he can steal your peace. Wow. That's revelation. So now, you must stay in the peace of God. You must swim in the peace of God. You must luxuriate in the peace of God. You must, you, must, you must know all the parameters of the peace of God. Because once you have peace with God, you can enjoy the peace of God. So you're not worried. You're not fearful. And you have no anxiety. Why? Because I cast my cares on Him because He cares for me. So if you are worried, that means that you are engaging in warfare which God told you you should be. By the way, remember, there are warfares that you are supposed to fight. Fear, anxiety, and stress are not those wars you fight. God says, I will fight for you. God fights those wars. <laughs> your war is against the enemy and against your territory. So make sure you don't fight the wrong war. Amen? Oh, I'm feeling good tonight. I felt that was just a, that was a mighty thing. So let me end by saying this. The war without demonic forces. You need to know what they are. You know, don't know, the, need to know where they are, and you need to know how they operate. Then you need to know about the inner war between the mind, the mind of Christ, and the mind of the flesh. The Bible says there's a warfare going on there. Paul says in Romans six, actually in Romans seven, he says, "The things that I would do, I do not, and the things that I do not, I do." There's this, and he says, "I realize that there's a." There's a warfare going on in my members. So, if you're going to be really honest before God, you realize that there are times when you want to do the right thing, but there's a force fighting against you, that old mindset. And the Bible says you have to overcome it. You have to confront it, you got to mortify it, and then you got to kill it. Now, I wanted to go to Colossians to end, Colossians chapter 3. And remember, I showed you Ephesians 6, I showed you Romans 6, I showed you Romans 8, and then I also hinted at Colossians 3, which I'm going to now. And when you read these chapters in their entirety, I only touched on a bit of it. When you read them in their entirety, you realize, wow, God is enlightening us about the warfare we're fighting. And here's the thing. Every time you win a war, there are spoils and there are rewards. Oh, write this down. You are not just fighting wars to fight wars. God says, I've given you an assignment, 
And when you win the assignment, there are certain benefits and there are certain rewards. Now the problem is most of us are not enjoying the benefit and not understanding the reward. So that means you think that God fights things for nothing. And I want you to be clear. In the book of Luke, God says anyone who goes up to war counts the cost. So if God has put you in a war, it's because there's something to gain. And if you as a Christian are warring and not gaining anything, you are not fighting God's war. You're fighting your own war. Oh, that was from the Spirit of God. Make sure you're fighting a divine war, not a, not a, not a personal war. Mm. So Colossians 3, let me just give you verses 1 and 2. It says there, um, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above. Remember, the mind on things above. By the way, the term mind and heart are interchangeable. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So your mind should be at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. There it is. Set your mind, your heart, on things above. In other words, what motivates you is what's above. What stimulates you is what's above. What directs you is what's above. So your information doesn't come through the five gates. Your, your, your information comes from the throne. So you have a throne mindset. Not a earthly mindset. And the Bible says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There it is. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now look at verse 5. Verse 5 is the key. But put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. There it is. There it is. So now you're beginning to see that the warfare is raging. And there are spoils and there are rewards. But then there are dimensions where warfare is, 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 is engaged. And then lastly, God wants you to understand that there are elements in each dimension. So there are certain kinds of snares that the devil uses in the external dimension. And there are certain tricks that he uses in the mind dimension. And then there are yet other things strategies he uses in the spirit dimension, spirit to spirit dimension, or soul to spirit. Let me give that, let me give a clarity on that last one. So the mind, the soul, fights against the spirit. So there is this warfare between soul and spirit. Uh Uh-huh. So the war within, sorry, the war without, the war within, and the war between. The war within, mind to mind. The war between, spirit to mind or soul to mind. And it's these wars that are going on when you don't operate in perfect peace. So now, my my here, here's my, my, my exhortation to you tonight and to myself. By the way, I'm not immune to this. Just because you know the word don't mean that you're immune. Let, let me just say this. I'm going to say what Paul says. Let the peace that passes all understanding, guard your heart and your mind. In other words, the peace of God means that my mind is set on the spirit realm. My mind is set on the throne, at the right hand of Jesus. Nothing in this realm can affect me and hurt me because God has given me victory. I now will war the authentic, legitimate war, which is the war that is divinely um, given to me. And I will not fight external and petty wars, wars that are personal. And then I will win, I will gain rewards and benefits. And then I will also process my salvation in three dimensions. Wow, we learned a lot tonight. I, that's a lot. I mean, that, I could take a year really going back over that and dissecting that. But I'm going to stop here. So, Sister Ava, I'm going to stop there. That was a review. We did not go over all of the elements and all of the verses, but we did cover some. So, uh, I'm going to ask uh, if there are any questions. Um, you know, so, are there any questions now? There ought to be some questions, because this is some very rich theology from the world. So, Dave, I'm going to open it up, Brother uh, Joseph.
If anyone types in a question, let me know and I'll try to answer those questions. I think we have a couple of minutes. I'm going to drink a little tea while I'm at it. But um, any feedback so far? Okay, I'm just going to... Oh, okay. So some... Yeah, let me see. I got some questions here. So... Okay, Dr. Wells, who's also a graduate. Oh, right. There's some people who wanted to know a little bit of my background. So, yeah, I've been doing apologetics for 30 years, and I think Brother Joseph put it in there. Uh, and then you put something else, Brother Joseph. There's a question uh, that someone asked. I didn't see the question. But, um, yeah, for those of you who wanted to know who I am, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm a converted Muslim, so I have a knowledge of a couple of things. And you know, I'm just sharing... Some of the revelation God has given me, I'm trying to show you where it's based and what it's based on. I'm not giving my opinion. My opinions are, opinions are like heads. Everybody has one. But the, ones that, the one that really counts is God's opinion. It's really not an opinion. It's his word and his mind. So I just wanted to show you his word and show you his mind. And then whatever you do with it is up to you. I, but my job is to show you and then move out the way. Let the Spirit of God show you, take you from there. So... Uh, um, so, Brother Joe, so I saw that, but did someone ask a question? Does anyone have a question? I'm hoping you have a question. I hope I didn't just lecture you. The only the one man asked the question, if God is not powerful, all knowing and good, why is there evil? All right, so this is a common question. Why is there evil? And I will just tell you, um, it's because God believes that in order for you to understand that he's good and that he's all-powerful, there has to be some means by which there is um, a complete reality. In other words, just because God is all-powerful and all-knowing doesn't mean that he can't have a, a reason that, that's reasonable to him, uh, that he would permit free uh, beings Right? Remember, we're moral beings, right? But we have a will. And, you see, most of our people don't really understand. When God said he made man in his image, that means he gave man the ability to have free will. So, on the one hand, if God's giving us free will, he has to permit us to use free will, or it wouldn't be free. So, for those people who, who use this question or launch this question, it's clear that they have a deficit in theology. They don't really understand. And I don't mean you personally who asked the question. I mean that people, this is a common question that people have, but they don't understand what we start with, the foundation. So to come to that question means that you're not aware of the foundation. So here's the foundation. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, but he creates beings in his image. And by making beings in his image, and making beings like him, we have the freedom to disobey, the freedom to choose. And if we truly have free will, that means that God has to make room for free will to be free. So the question actually, uh, evil in the world literally, in my mind, confirms there's a God and confirms that God is authentic and confirms that God keeps his word and confirms that God is legitimate and confirms that God will allow all scenarios to play out. And confirms that God is all wise. Because if he didn't allow all the um, scenarios to play out, then people will say, well, what kind of God is he that he doesn't allow there to be free will if he says it's free? So then God would be called a liar if he didn't let free will be free. So you see, God can't seem to win, even when he's trying to be, you know, complete and comprehensive. So I would just tell people who ask that question, make sure you get your foundation right, and make sure you understand what kind of God we're talking about. We're not just talking about a God who just does things capriciously, but he does things based on principle. And if he does things on principle, then he has to be consistent. And he is. Uh, any other questions? That was a good question. I like that question. Any other questions? You mean there are no questions? Oh, my. <laughs> there are no questions. So, Sister Ava, what do you think? Yeah. So, what about what you think? Where can I find more than just seven different types of power? Yes, you have spoken on Matthew 9. 
Well, right. So there is an article that I have that I've given to students that literally talks about the eight kinds of power. Um, and I'll be happy to make that available to uh, the students on the line tonight. Um, and for those of you who are, who are not connected with Omega Amen, I want to encourage you to become a member because we have all kinds of little uh, tools. I think I mentioned in the beginning that we have access to all kinds of tools. Uh, so for Danae, Danae, um, I would tell you, I've listed three powers already, so you really only have five left, right? So I've talked to you about dunamis power. I've talked to you about um, exousia or authority power. Uh, I've also spoken to you uh, a little bit about um, Iskus power, again, Iskus. So I, I, thought, I think I spoke about three kinds of powers tonight. I kind of emphasized two. But you're right, the believer has, I think, seven or eight different kinds of power. And the problem is that most Christians don't even use them. So the real problem is, is I, I have an article that goes over all of them, but I would just caution you, don't learn all of them, don't get them all and only use one. Because now when you get all, God says, to whom much is given, much is required. So let me ask you, you sure you want the rest of those powers? Because then you're going to have to use them. And if you use them, that means that the enemy going to know you use them. And therefore, he's going to have to up step up his game concerning you. So <laughs> if you want to get those powers, just remember, those powers come with responsibility. So let me ask you again, you still want those powers? You still want that information? <laughs> I give it to you, but to whom much is given, much is required. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, that was a good question, didn't it? That was a good question, girl. That was a good question. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ava now. Right. Um, by the way, we, we're doing a lot on this ministry, and we want to make sure that everybody is um, connected. So, you know. For those of you who really want to be learn and really engage, I'm going to encourage you to, you know, give to join the ministry. By joining the ministry, you know, there's a monthly fee, sorry, a, a yearly fee. I recommend that you do that because we have access to a lot of information, a lot of um, revelation. So what I'm giving to you is revelation, not just information, but it's revelation. It's content that comes from God's word that maximizes your life. So. Uh, I would encourage you that if you're, if you're going to really be a part of this ministry, just, just join. So that way you get access to all the tools we have. You know, you're going to have Bible, special Bibles, uh, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, I have other tapes that I've done, other, other fresh revelation that God has given me. And you want to get access to those so you can be able to be fully equipped. So I want to encourage you to be a part of the ministry. I want to greet Brother Horace and Sister Carol. Uh, Brother Horace is a, um, a prophet, him and his lovely wife, uh, from Jamaica. Been to Jamaica, by the way, it was interesting. I was in Jamaica uh, a couple of years ago with Brother Horace, um, and we were able to download in Jamaica some really interesting revelations for Jamaica. And uh, by the way, I was just recently in Barbados, for my friends in Barbados, I was able to download the four dimensional, uh, four dimensions of life. So. Just like I'm talking about the three dimensions of warfare, there are four dimensions of spiritual life. And I only just touched on it in Barbados. That's the word God gave me for Barbados. So wherever I go in the world, God gives me something fresh for each country. So if you're from a country and you want me to come, send me something so God can give me some revelation to share with you. So, uh, by the way, Brother Joseph, we're going to India. I don't know when it is, but we're going to get fresh revelation for India. So, uh, by the way, the liaison officer for the ministry... Uh, well, Sister Ava, Sister Ava, thank you so much. By the way, I also want to thank Sister Ava, Ava Dawn. I've monopolized tonight, but she is the prayer general for Alpha Omega um, Ministries. She is the general over our prayer section, so we do pray. We pray 24 hours, 24-7, written prayers, vocal prayers, uh, closet prayers, floor prayers, fasting prayers. So if you have a prayer or need, you can get connected to Alpha Omega, and um, 
We want to engage you in, in, in every every kind of prayer. So, so this ministry is valuable. And I love to have questions. When I don't have questions, I get a little bored. <laughs> I like questions because questions allow me to think and pull out other things that I don't normally. That's one more question. One more question. Oh, I love questions. Yeah. Apart from, yes, what is all right, so I didn't get the question. Apart from fear, what is peace? Or apart from fear, what what else diminishes peace? Oh, oh, well, there's a lot of things. So. The power of God is sort of something that um, that increases. So when you connect to God, both in fellowship and also in worship and in all, also in prayer, it's almost as if you are like a battery that's being charged. So the glory of God charges your inner man, and your inner man retains that energy. And that energy now can be expressed and liberated. So the power of God can be, um, ex you know, can explode out of you in many different ways. But the things that diminish it, sin, any kind of sin diminishes it. Any kind of unbelief, a belief of sin, uh, can diminish it. Any kind of double-mindedness, if you're double-minded, thinking two opposite things at the same time, that diminishes it. Um, fear, as I said, diminishes it. Um, also, um, you know, sort of basically anything that is apart from the glory of God diminishes it. By the way, all sin really is coming short of what God, God wants you to do, what his glory is, what his will is. So anything outside the will of God diminishes his, his power. Because the power only flows when there is an open line. There's a, there's a connection between heaven and earth, right? So when you are aligned with heaven, the power flows. But then if you are out of step or out of union or out of sync with God, then the, 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 the power stops or is diminished. It doesn't really diminish, but it can be interrupted. Um, but the Bible says we have the Spirit of God within us. So let me be clear that it's not like, okay, we're waiting for God to send the energy. We have the Spirit of God in us. So the first thing you need to do in order to keep the power is to get saved. Then once you get saved, you have the inner man, which has the Spirit of God, and then the Spirit of God keeps filling you. So the Bible says, keep being filled with the Spirit. That's where the energy comes from. That's where the power comes from, the constant filling of the Spirit of God. And you do that by reading the Word and by praying and by being connected to God, by fellowshipping with God's people, by going to church, by doing spiritual activities, by operating in... The assignment God has given you. All of that activates the spirit. All of that causes the energy to grow. By the way, the energy can get so powerful that it can get in your clothes. The energy can actually literally saturate your clothes so that now your shirt, you take it off and put it somewhere, somebody can get healed from your shirt. It actually starts to invade physical things. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth and he slept on a bed and then he went and left the bed, and then somebody who got in that bed literally felt the glory of God on him. And he wasn't there anymore, but the, but the actual glory literally was left in the bed. And that's what happens with that power. It just it permeates everything. I hope that answers the question. That's a good question. I love questions. I love questions. Oh, yeah, and, and Sister Ava so, uh, so wisely said also anger. Anger, um, no, not anger all, not anger by itself. The Bible says that anger that is, that leads to sin. Let's be clear. Anger can be righteous. But when anger leads to sin, then, or, or it's held over, over, overnight, then it, it can be something that, that can be destructive and diminishes, uh, diminishes your power. Also, unforgiveness. She's right. Unforgiveness, definitely. You know, if you have unforgiveness in your heart or bitterness or hatred or malice, all those things interrupt the power of God. And, and of course it would. As I said, any kind of sin, any kind of 
disconnection from God. Anything that's not of God, anything that's not like God, breaks your fellowship with God, and therefore interrupts the power. Right. Any other questions, Brother Joseph? Dave, any questions? Right. Yes. Oh, I just got a question. Somebody asked me, what is a malignant spirit? Um, well, let me just be clear. Remember I talked to you about unclean spirits? It's easy to figure out what that is. Then there are seducing spirits, spirits that are basically expert at, you know, fooling people. Then the Bible talks about how there are evil spirits who motivate people to do evil things. Um, and then there are um, uh, there are other kinds. The Bible literally identifies these various spirits. Now malignant spirits are spirits that are designed to cause destruction. And they are poisonous because they they um, they mitigate and, and, and they uh, broker, um, you know, they use people's feelings and their emotions to cause them to do things that are so terrible that a little... I, I give it a good example. Um, the spirit that controlled Jezebel was a malignant spirit. So it wasn't only out to get you out the way. They wanted to humiliate you. They wanted to um, excoriate you. It wanted to, in some case, literally eviscerate you. Uh, it would want to murder you, but not only murder you, murder your whole family. So it's malignant. It's not just evil, but it, it actually has, you know, it has a desire to obliterate and to ex extinguish everything about you. That's more than just evil. That's malignant. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Also, the anti malignant is just that obstructs the war of God. Right. Right. So, it yeah, it obstructs the war. It obstructs the spirit. And, and very, very evil. Right, but you. Like a cancer. Yeah, we use the word malignant, right, to refer to something that spreads. So. Exactly. Right. So, it's it, it's not something that's just an act. Something that 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 is done that people catch on. It's like it's like a it's like a movement, an evil movement. Yeah. You see. So, uh, for instance, it's sort of like it's sort of like um, bullying. Bullying is not something that one person does, but it catches on, right? And lots of people do it. It's like very, 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 uh, you know, very, very persuasive. Any other questions? Well, you know what? To say, Ava, I think they, they, they're caught up in the perfect piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, are the people from Barbados on? Um, I believe they are. I know uh, for a fact um, that there's um, one or two people on. So, um, so, I know they're on, but if they have a question, they certainly can ask me. And I'll be happy to answer. But you, but you see, we covered so much stuff here, and um, what's interesting is that people really are not used to seeing warfare like this. Um, oh, Sister Dawn and uh, Horace are on the line, um, but you can't write anything, right? But, yeah, but I, I know they're on the line. I know Brother Horace has a question, but I know he can't get to me, but I want to say... Um, if I know oh, what hard is... Uh-huh. Yes. Right, all right. So Sister Carol can um, can type it, Brother Horace. So if you have a question, um, you can certainly type it. But notice we covered a lot of material tonight. And I, I think now when you start to feel fear and anxiety, you have to begin to check. Wait a minute. How did I get here? What... 
who's pulling me out of my perfect view? What, 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 what's this? Where, where did I let the warfare get past my, my defense? Because now you realize when the Bible says God is not giving you a spirit of fear, fear is not just an emotion. It involves a spirit. And that spirit is not the spirit of God. So when you start to have that emotion of fear, you got to ask yourself, wait a minute, where is that coming from? It's not coming from God. The only fear we have is a fear of the Lord, which is a reverential fear, a fear of love, a fear of respect, but not fear, you know, craving, cringing fear, as if we're going to die or we're, we're going to be eliminated. We don't have those kind of fears because the Father is for us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. Right. So, if there are no other questions, Sister Ava, I'm going to end it there, um, and I'm going to um, keep my word and, and really just kind of stop there. But I really had a good time tonight; was good. And um, in the future, I think we're going to try to connect people and actually show them the verses on online. So, so Brother Joseph, no more no more questions, right? Um. Okay. Oh, I got one. I, okay, I, I got I got one question. How do we know which battles are ours? Oh, that's a very good question. Let me answer that briefly. One of the things that God has given you are certain gifts. By the way, I don't know Brother Habakkuk, writer. Does anybody know him? I don't know him. I just like the name. But Brother Habakkuk, I don't know you, but welcome to... Uh, Omega Amen into um, Nehemiah. I'm not sure how you got our information, but I'm happy you're on. How do we know our battles? Well, the Bible says generally the battle is not ours, but it's the Lord. So any battle is, is the Lord. But as the Lord's representative, He has equipped you with certain gifts. And the wars that you are supposed to fight are aligned with the gifts that God has given you. Um, by the way, you need to, uh, honestly, you need to learn, uh, maybe you should go to the website and get my, um, my teaching on spiritual gifts, because what I did in spiritual gifts, I tried to show you how the gifts that God gives you are major and minor gifts, and the major and minor gifts tell you what your, what, where your warfare is. Let me give you an example. Remember David. David was a shepherd. But for a shepherd, the wars that a shepherd has to fight has to do with people who want to come and take the sheep. Right? So David says, I fought the lion and I fought the bear. And I can beat this Philistine. Why? Because the lion and the bear wanted to take his sheep when he was a shepherd of a sheep. Now when he became the shepherd of people, the lion, which is in the form of a Nephilim or a giant, wanted to take and kill his people, so he had to fight against that giant too. So, usually your warfare has to do with your calling and your assignment. And your calling and assignment will lead you into a certain domain. And in a certain domain, there will be enemies against God. And because you are gifted to have dominion in that domain, you need to fight against those particular demonic forces in that domain. So you shouldn't be fighting in another domain because you're not equipped to fight that. By the way, you are equipped to fight against principalities and powers, but God has not equipped you to fight every principality and power. Principality and powers are associated with domains and regions. Principality, by the way, means region, principle, or a principality, a region. So you're called to fight in a certain region and to fight certain powers that dominate in that region. So, you have a certain jurisdiction. Let me just say that. Even Paul, by the way, if you read the book of Acts, last thing. Even Paul, in the book of Acts, God said to him, Paul, you cannot go to Asia. They'll kill you. Now, this is God talking, the Spirit of God, talking to Paul, the great apostle, telling him, don't go to Asia. You ain't, they, you, you, they'll kill you over there. And Paul was like, wait, but I went to Ephesus, and I went to, yeah, you're... Your ministry was in Asia Minor. But there are certain places in Asia you can't go. Because that's not where your assignment is. 
I hope that helps you, Brother Habakkuk. Okay. Okay, Brother Joseph, I think we're good. So, Sister Ava, what should we do now? Oh, by the way, yes, Sister Shadi was on the line, so I want to say hi to Sister Shadi. I got that email as well. Sister Anne Marie was on the line as well, and she wanted me to expound on the three types of power. Uh, let me look. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to turn the live up? Okay. Let me turn. Yeah. 